Welcome to Copcast. I'm Rumbi Chakamba, Associate Editor at DevEx, and I've headed to Sham el Sheikh in Egypt for this year's United Nations Climate Conference. In this podcast series, we bring you inside the walls of the Blue Zone for a series of in depth conversations with climate and development leaders, asking them the big questions. What's really needed to make meaningful progress towards climate goals, and what role should the development community play to support that? At the end of the day, climate change is happening at the local level. It's happening in your neighborhood and in my neighborhood, and those neighborhoods are in cities. In 2017, extreme weather devastated Sierra Leone's capital city of Freetown when torrential rains led to landslides that killed over 1,000 people. Now the city's population is grappling with temperature increases and population swells due to people migrating from rural areas as erratic rainfalls make subsistence farming less sustainable. In this episode of COPcast, DEVEC senior reporter Sarah Jerving sat down with Freetown Mayor Yvonne Akisoya who's working to help her city adapt in areas such as building heat-resistant market shelters and building a cable car to cut down on emissions and pollution. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So you are leading the C40 mayoral delegation to COP27. What is the C40 mayoral delegation and what is your message to world leaders at COP27? Well, C40 is an organization of 96 cities, um, some of the largest cities, mega cities in the world, who uh, collectively are responsible for 75% of emissions, um, and therefore also very much uh, pay a large role in their ability for us to address the climate crisis. Um, my city is not a mega city. There's 16 of us, which are smaller cities called innovation cities. But what we're doing here at COP is amplifying the voice of cities. At the end of the day, climate change is happening at the local level. It's happening in your neighborhood and in my neighborhood, and those neighborhoods are in cities. The change is happening, the consequences of climate change in terms of disasters, extreme weather events, um, impact on infrastructure, that's all happening in cities. We are, as mayors, on the front line in addressing that. And it's so important that we play more of a role in being part of defining not just the solutions that we implement at our city level, but at a global level, the policies um, that need to be put in place, challenging national governments to make good on their commitments, um, and ensuring that we all work together collectively and collaboratively to meet the objective of not going beyond 1.5 degrees. And what, uh, how has Freetown been impacted by climate change and what sort of impacts do you see at the city level uh, moving forward? Like many places um, in the developing world, we are tiny, minuscule contributors to the, to the crisis, um, but we really bear the brunt. And on a practical level, it's extreme weather events. Um, extreme weather events which impact us directly and indirectly. And let me say the direct first. So heavy rain, unusually heavy rain in 2017 on the 14th of August um, almost well just over a thousand people died in a mudslide um, gone in less than three minutes um, but beyond that we still experience flooding landslides extreme heat is becoming more and more of a feature um, and all of this as I said has a direct impact um, but there's the indirect impact, and that is because outside of the city, in rural areas where farming populations um, make up the majority of people who rely on agriculture, subsistence agriculture, when you have the sort of weather changes that we're seeing, um, crops fail. You know, rain comes when it shouldn't, it doesn't come when it should, and, and there isn't the reserve, there isn't the insurance policy available, there isn't any cushion. Um, so we see huge rural urban migration, which puts even more pressure on the city. So indirectly, um, the climate change is driving our population up. It's putting more pressure on already strained infrastructure. It's increasing deforestation um, as people look for places to live and literally 
cut down forests to do so. Um, so, so the impact of climate change is very present and very real. Um, and the resources and the finance available to tackle it are simply not where they need to be. So you mentioned extreme heat. Um, last year, you announced the appointment of Africa's first chief heat officer. What does a chief heat officer do, and why did you decide to create that role? Many times when people talk about um, the effects of climate change, what comes to mind, particularly in my part of the world, is, is that really physical, obvious, huge disaster seen from flooding, from uh, um, mudslides, um, even from drought. Um, but beyond those, you have a silent killer. And that is rising temperatures, um, which impact particularly the informal sector. 60% of women in our city, 60% plus, actually are traders. And the vast majority of markets are open door. So think about it for a minute. Sitting in the sun, in temperatures which are ever rising, um, which mean that there is less access to water because we also have the challenge of water catchments drying up, which is impacted by deforestation. You see how everything, the domino effect of it all. Um, additionally, I mentioned this rural urban migration, the increasing population. In the absence of land use planning and building permitting, which is an issue of legislation between central government and the city, in the absence of that, we've seen the proliferation of informal settlements. Um, and the major housing structure, material, for homes in those settlements is corrugated iron. So you literally are living in an oven. Um, so it's been important for us to move beyond an anecdotal uh, kind of engagement or sense of us having a problem with heat and try to get focus on it, um, which means collecting data, means building mitigating plans, and really um, appreciative of the role of the Ashrock Resilience Center in making this a priority. So our chief officer, chief heat officer, is one of five that were appointed last year, um, working with Ashrock, um, and it's been very, very useful, very useful, because like I said, it's about that focus. There's a lot of data out there, um, maybe in our city not as much as we'd like, but you know, it's, it's much easier to get data and information on the, on the extreme weather events. But on the silent, constant, increasing temperature, the heat islands that exist within the city, the major areas of vulnerability, ideas around how you can mitigate against it, one of which is being implemented already. So a couple of nights ago, I was in a market where we're just finishing putting up market shade covers. So these are heat resistant um, canopies um, on metal frames with solar lights beneath. So from, from the market women's perspective, it was like, wow. <laughs> Um, you know, resistance or protection from the sun, but then in the rainy season as well, protection from the rain. And it's, it's about focus. And I think that concept of focus is what on a different level needs to be applied to everything in this climate conversation. Moving beyond the rhetoric to real practical interventions um, and money to support those interventions. So no country has developed a 1.5 degree compatible plan in line with the Paris Agreement, uh, but 62 cities have submitted these types of plans. Can you talk about what your plan looks like in Freetown and kind of what went into developing that plan? So we have um, a climate action plan, which um, like as you've mentioned, other cities were committing to net zero by 2035. Um, and elements of that adaptation mitigation, um, key highlights I would say are a continuation and expansion, a scaling of hashtag Freetown the Tree Town, um, which started with us planting a million trees over two rainy seasons, 
but we're looking to build on that. We're, we're, by December, we'll be 800,000 trees in. Um, and what matters most is that we're not just planting, we're growing. It means we're employing young people predominantly um, with a high percentage of women um, to monitor the growth of those trees, working with communities for there to be sense, a sense of ownership and protection. And protection is important because this is a city where 82% of cooking fuel is wood or coal. So literally that brings another element of the, of the Climate Action Plan into play, which is the development of an affordable, accessible fuel alternative, cooking fuel alternative. And so we're investing in looking at opportunities for gas to be sold in smaller quantities because most people can't afford the overall in the, the initial investment into gas um, systems. Um, we're looking at other natural solutions like um, a circular, uh, we're closing the circle on our liquid waste treatment plant that we introduced um, just a year and a half ago. Um, and to having that sludge, we're experimenting now with having that sludge become briquettes for burning. There are other initiatives that eco-entrepreneurs are working on. For example, making briquettes from um, coconut husks that we are you know, looking to investigate and see how we can partner. So that's, you know, we've got that going on. But another major source of, um, of emissions for us, and it's not just for us, it's not just the emissions in terms of absolute numbers, because we know relative, in relative terms, it's really small on the global scale. But those emissions actually have health consequences. Um, so particularly from transport, which, uh, yeah, really, really, really it presents a real opportunity for improvement. Transport is our second largest emitter of greenhouse gases um, with old vehicles, predominantly old vehicles, um, being used on, those, on the streets. No public transport, mass transit. Uh, it, it, interestingly, the old vehicles are public transport. So like 80% of people use public transport but it's low occupancy. So it's either the, the tuk-tuks, as you might know them, the three-wheelers, or the motorcycles, or the old, old taxis and pura-puras, the pura-puras being the minibuses. Very, very environmentally unfriendly, um, but more significantly, really bad for health. Uh, high incidences of lung uh, um, diseases, um, respiratory, respiratory, respiratory illnesses, um, and, and other related um, conditions. So a part of that plan to net zero is introducing a cable car. And we have started, a, we've done pre-feasibility and we're now in the full feasibility phase of that. It'll be a game changer. It will be a game changer. It will drop emissions, but it'll also increase economic productivity, increase value of life, connect hillside informal settlements that I just mentioned, which will lead to investment in those areas. So that's one of the really good things about, you know, climate change interventions, climate action. Ultimately, they do create jobs, they do provide better infrastructure, um, and they will contribute positively to the economy. So those are some examples of, of what we're doing in Freetown to move towards net zero. Climate change has been named the biggest threat facing humanity by the World Health Organization. Yet too often, climate change and global health are treated as separate, unrelated issues. In a new series from DevEx, we explore the impacts of the climate crisis on human health around the world and how a planetary health perspective can help provide solutions. Search for DevEx Planet Health to find out more. At this COP, you published the C40 Ambition Handbook uh, to share some lessons from cities that national governments can actually adopt. Um, can you talk about what sort of lessons from cities are shared in this handbook? I, I think one of the things which we constantly reference as city leaders is the fact that we put community at the heart of what we do, and we have to, because we are in community. 
um, and the the some of the lessons we've learned include the the benefit of having that community involvement in the development of action plans. I mean, one of the things that is said repeatedly, I find in, in many circles, um, in, in you know, for such as this, like COP is, and I, I actually just had that conversation from a UK minister, with a UK minister, how do you get the ordinary person to understand? Um, and I think this is one of the things that cities can demonstrate, that we've been able to localize the challenge um, and describe it and engage our communities in a manner which allows them to see themselves within the within the crisis. Um, we were just talking about trade, for example, and how our carbon it, um, our carbon footprint is not just about what we do, but also what we buy. Um, and our interaction city to city means that there's a lot more, and maybe it's easier for us to be able to engage in these conversations and demonstrate this. Another example is how what's going on in one city um, can impact another from the perspective of migration. So again, at city level, C40s works closely with MMC, the Mayor's Migration Council. Um, and um, myself and the Mayor of Milan have a partnership on fashion, the Mayor's Dialogue. And you think, why fashion with climate change? Because what we're seeking to do is to address some of the underlying causes of migration. I mentioned earlier on rural urban migration because of crop failure. Well, that often moves out beyond rural urban to international. So it's, it's saying, what are, how do we work together to invest in alternatives in service, for example, um, that opens a market from one city, for one city's youth population in another city? And we've chosen fashion as an example of that. So I, I think what we what we've been able to do with with networks like C40 is to be is to demonstrate from again in terms of lessons learned for nation states. Um, I think a big lesson would be devolve more to us, give more funding to the city level because we are more agile and we're more nimble, um, and we can help national governments uh, meet their NC, the NDCs. Um, by allowing some of that implementation to flow through us and, and by strengthening the collaboration between local and national governments. Um, and are national governments receptive to that or what are you, what are you hearing on that? That's an interesting one and I think, uh, I think it's a very mixed bag. Um, as you can imagine, you know, there are 190, 190 is the official number of countries in the world. Um, and for our C40 cities, the 96 cities, um, some of those cities are in the same country, obviously, so it's not duplicated in terms of countries, but you've got over 50 countries um, represented there. And I would say it differs very significantly country to country. Um, the best practice, the best model um, I've seen, I'm not going to name the country um, in case somebody from their country goes and says no 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 but from the outside looking in we do see examples where countries come to something like COP27 with their cities as a delegation that's not the case in my city it's not the case in in other cities um, in other countries so I think best practice is where you see that recognition that we're not in competition um, and this is often caused because of political lenses, perhaps opposition mayors being in, you know, in office and maybe being seen by the national government as not development partners, but perhaps competitors. And we cannot afford this in this climate emergency. We cannot afford to put politics above working together to address climate change. It's too urgent. There's too much at risk. There's too much at stake. And so you have a lot of initiatives in Freetown, and one of the issues that you do here in cities and at the national level is just competing resources. So what has been done in Freetown to ensure that the budget includes these climate uh, initiatives? Um, I guess, as I mentioned earlier, we have a climate action plan. And 
in the session I've just had, um, it was a C40 City session, and I, I started off my remarks by highlighting the vast difference that there is between cities in terms of economic strength and resource availability full stop. Um, so it, it's not even a question in our case of prioritization. And yes, we have prioritized um, um, be, through our budget, through creating for the first time ever um, a, a climate action committee of the council. So we actually now, um, a, among you know, the sort of historic committees like finance and health and um, education, we now actually have climate action, which means that there's more of a focus, there's a deliberate uh, um, attention being given to this, uh, and similar to what I said before with heat. Um, but we have a major resource gap, which we are seeking to fund through, um, through development institutions, organizations, through climate finance, um, through private sector uh, collaboration and partnerships, but the gap is still there. Um, and even when we have been able to access commitments to resource, um, the gap persists because there's such a time lag between commitment and disbursement. And I think my message um, since I got here and before I got here, and it will continue after I leave here, is that you cannot talk about urgency and then fail to deliver you know, with urgency because we, we get no further forward. And I've been, um, I've been interested to hear colleagues, they are talking about much bigger numbers than myself, for example, the mayor of Bristol uh, on the, and the head of the Scott, uh, Glasgow Council, we were both in a session just now, and their message was the same. Their figures are multiples of mine, and they do have more access because their own city budgets, own source revenue enables them to leverage um, much more capital than, than I can. Um, but I suppose the scale of the problem is not restricted to your balance sheet or your budget. That is the reality. You know, it doesn't matter if your city has no credit risk rating. It doesn't matter if your city doesn't have deep pockets. If your city, as with mine, is significantly impacted by a climate crisis, we can't afford to not find a solution which brings other financing to the table and makes it available not five years from when it's committed or not five years from when we start the conversation, 20, 30, seven years from now. We haven't got much time on our hands and that's on our own man-made commitments. At the rate at which we're going, at the rate at which the temperatures are increasing, seven years is maybe just kind of an arbitrary targets in terms of timelines, that urgency needs to translate now so that we actually don't worsen the situation in the, set, in the period between now and 2030. So you have this network of, of mayors. Uh, can you give us more of an insider look into how mayors are connecting into these issues? Uh, do you have regular virtual meetings? Kind of what is the outreach like to, to kind of bring mayors into this network? So it, um, we, I think it works on a couple of different levels. Um, there's the business as usual and then there's crisis. Um, when COVID happened, that was a fantastic example of how mayors came together. And those networks just you know, sprung into a different level of life um, with regular virtual meetings. Um, and, but of course, now that we're sort of out of the heat of the crisis, we're still in the climate crisis, but we can't, you know, one can't manage one's diary working at that level. But the, the networks are very, very um, grounded um, and, and they, they work constantly. Um, and they do that through having a secretariat, or they all have their secretariats, but we also have focal persons within our, our, our councils. So within our institutions, um, so there'll be people who will be working with the secretary on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, moving agendas forward um, and briefing mayors. And then we will, depending on which institution it is, whether it's MCC or Mayor's Dialogue or uh, um, C40s, we will engage as mayors um, on a less regular basis, but having had the constant work going on with our teams. Um, but those engagements are very fruitful. 
um, they, and they're very focused um, and output oriented. And, and I must say that C40 Cities as a network also has a very strict membership rule. You've got to meet your commitments. So when you make your commitments to your climate action plan, when you make your, your other commitments, because they're, they're levels of commitments, you are assessed on progress. And if you fail to deliver against what you're committing to do as a C40 city, you are asked to leave the organization. So it's very much about delivering on the results. It's, the networks are not talking shops. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for listening to COPcast. We'll be publishing episodes every day throughout COP27. So make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast streaming platform. And if you've enjoyed today's episode, please share it with others you think would be interested in it. You can also leave us a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts. If you have some feedback about this episode that you want to share or are at COP and want to let us know what we should be covering, we'd love to hear from you. You can find us on social media at devex and at rumbichakamba underscore, or you can drop us an email at podcast at devex.com. 